ፊትናቹ የተከበራቹ የቲክቶክ ኢንስታግራም ሶሉሽን ሀብ ዩቲዩብ ቻናል ብዙ ሰዎች እኔ መምህር ጌታ ፕሮፌሰር ሳይባላለሁኝ በወላይ ተሶሎ ዩኒቨርሲቲ የሜካኒካል ኢንጂነሪንግ ትምህርት ክፍል መምህር ነኝ በዚህ ዩቲዩብ ቻናል ለሜካኒካል ኢንጂነሪንግ ተማሪዎች የተለያዩ የኢንተግራም ሞዴል እና ዋና ዋና ጥያቄዎችን እየሰራው ለተማሪዎች ማቅረብ ይታወቃል ሁላችሁም ለዚህ ዩቲዩብ ቻናል አዲስ ሆነናችሁ ሰብስክራይብ ቦታ ተመቻን ለይ የቻናላችን በዚህ ቶንና ቪዲዮን ሼር ላይክ እና በቪዲዮ ላይ ኮሜንቶችን በመጻፍ ቻናሉን እንድትታበረታቱላ እንድትደግፉላለሁ በዚህ ቪዲዮ ለሜካኒካል ምንድስና ተማሪዎች ዋና ኮርስ ኦር ኮር ኮምፒቴንስ ኮርስ ከሆነው አንዱ ማሽን ኤለመንት ነው ማሽን ኤለመንት የተለያዩ ጥያቄዎችን በዚህ ቪዲዮ ላይ ይያላቸው መጥቻለሁኝ ቪዲዮ ሲጀምሩ ላይ ታርጋችሁን ሲጀምሩና እስከ መጨረሻ እንድታዩ ታጃችሁን በኋላ መጨረሻ ላይ ሌሎች ሼር እንድታደርጉ ብላለሁኝ የቻናሉን አዲስ ሆነናችሁ በትካምን ሰብስክራይብ ማድረግ የቻናል ቤስተብ እንድትሆኑ የማሽን ኤለመንት 1 ጥያቄ ነው ማሽን ኤለመንት በሁለት ካቴጎሪ ነው ያለው ማሽን ኤለመንት 1 እና ማሽን ኤለመንት 2 አለ በዚህ ቪዲዮ የማሽን ኤለመንት 1 ፓርት 1 ነው ይያላችሁ የመጣሁት ይሄ ፓርት 1 ነው ፓርት 2ም ይከተላል ዘን የማሽን ኤለመንት 2ም ጥያቄዎቹን በከተይ ቪዲዮዎች ሰራለሁ አሁን ከተታ ወደ ጥያቄዎች ወዳለሁ የመጀመሪያ ጥያቄ ጥያቄ ቁጥር 1 which one of the following is not true about the failure of a machine learning a by failure it is meant the actual break of the material b elastic failure of machine elements result in excess of deformation c fracture failure of the machine element results in the breaking of the component into two parts d machine elements made from ductile material may exhibit an elastic type of failure so which one of the, uh, this the given alternative not describe the failure of the machine element So to choose the correct answer we have to know each and every or we have to discuss each and every choice or option in detail and let us see their explanation here So in engineering in the engineering concept when we say failure it doesn't necessarily mean the actual break of the material rather it can occur in various forms such as elastic deformation plastic deformation or the fracture form in the context of machine element elements doesn't solely refer to the actual break or fracture of the material instead it encompasses the broader range of behaviors and outcomes so a machine element can fail in different ways as you know machine elements can fail in different ways and this failure can manifest as elastic deformation plastic deformation or the fracture form also so the alternatives a b c and d can be explained in this form so when we say by failure it means the actual break of the material this statement is not entirely accurate because failure indicates various modes not just the breaking of the material so in b elastic failure of machine elements result in excessive deformation so in elastic failure it implies that the material returns to its original shape after deformation but it doesn't necessarily involve breaking and in c the fracture failure of the machine element result in the breaking of the component into two parts when it's a fracture failure it's basically referred to the breaking of the material this statement is accurate also. And the machine element made from the ductile material may exhibit an elastic type of failure that means this statement is also accurate when you say ductile material this material is or ductile material which can undergo significant plastic deformation may experience elastic failure without actually breaking so option a is not true because failure includes more than just the breaking of the material in the context of machine error. so from this the statement uh, the statement that is not true about the failure of the machine element is choice a 
a failure, it means the actual breaking of the material. So this is this doesn't describe the uh, failure of machine elements. The correct answer for this question is choice A. This part. Choice A means this. <coughs> So this is the correct answer. Question number two. Which one of the following is not true about the strengths and the stress of machine learning? A. Strength is an inherent inherent property of a machine element. Strength is an inherent property of a machine element. B. Stress are the magnitude of strengths at which something something of interest occurs. C. Stress is a state property of machine element. D. Maximum stress should be less than the string of a machine element. So let us see the explanation for this also. Okay. When you say stress, it is a measure of an internal resistance of a material to the formation under an applied load. So stress, usually this stress is calculated as the force divided by area and is not an in inherent property of the material but it depends on the applied force and materials geometry therefore the statement that is not true about the strengths and stress of machine is the choice or the concept which is expressed in choice c stress is a state property of a machine element so uh, this stress is not a state property we can see by displaying one by one. When I say strength is an inherent property of a machine element, this statement is generally true. Strength is a property of the material from which the machine element is made. Different materials have different strengths, and the strength of the material is an inherent characteristic. And choice B, the stress are the magnitude of strengths at which something of interest occurs. Also, this statement is generally true because stress is a measure of the internal resistance of material to the formation. When the stress on the material reaches a certain magnitude, often corresponding to its strength, something of interest may occur, such as the formation or failure. So this is also true. And and C, stress is a state property of machine element. And this statement is not true. As I have said, this statement at choice C is not true because stress is not a state property. It is a measure of the force per unit area within a material. And it depends on the applied load and the material's geometry. So the state properties, on the other hand, when we say state properties, they are independent of the paths taken to reach a particular state and only depend on the current state of the system. Due to this, this statement is incorrect. This stress is, it is not a state property of the machine. The choice D, maximum stress should be less than the strength of the machine element. So this statement is generally true. To, to prevent the failure, as we know, to prevent the failure, the, failure, the maximum stress experienced by the machine element should be less than it is strengths and this ensures a safety margin and accounts for uncertain in material properties and loading conditions. So in summary, when we see the the choices, choice A, B and D are generally correct. Why? Choice C is not true in the content of mechanical engineering as machine element. So this choice C is correct answer for the question provided. So here, the concept or the statement which is not true about the strengths and the stress of the machine element is, stress is, this is stress is, it is a state property of a machine. This is not true. This stress is not a state property of a machine element. Okay. The third question, which one of the following doesn't describe the design of the machine? A. To design is to create a new and a better machine. B. To design is formulating a plan for the specific 
using it. C to design is improving the existing machine. D to design is one way of decision making and innovation, innovative process. So which one of this doesn't describe the design of the machine? Well, let's see the explanation for this. Okay, let us see one by one. Well, to design is to create a new and better machine. This statement is generally true. This statement to design is to create a new and better machine. It is true. When we say this to design, design involves creating something new and its goal, it involves creating something new and its goal is often to improve upon existing solution or create innovative and better products. So it may be to design means it is to create new or modifying the existing one. So the first one is true. And the next one to design is formulating a plan for a specific need. This statement is also true or accurate because when we say design involves it is design involves formulating a plan or a strategy to meet specific needs or requirements and it's about finding solution to problem or fulfilling a set of criteria a set of criteria we have criteria to fulfill when we are starting to design so this when we say this to design is from formulating a plan for a specific need this is generally true or accurate perfect and see when we say to design is improving the existing machine this statement is also true. Design can involve enhancing or optimi optimizing the existing product or system to make them more efficient, effective, or competitive, or to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of existing product as well as to make this competitive, we can improve the existing product or existing machine. So to design is improving the existing machine. This is also perfect. Others design is one way to design is one way of decision making and innovative process so the statement is not as precise as the other because design doesn't design does involve decision making and innovate innovation but it is more than just a way of decision making when I say design design is a holistic process that include creativity problem solving planning and decision making to create a solution or a product so it is not one way of decision making an innovative process in summary when we summarize this choices a b and c are accurate or correct which describes the design process while choice d while containing some truths doesn't fully capture the com comprehensive nature of the design process so from this this choice D is correct. This choice D is correct. So when we say this, while this decision making and innovative are often part of the design process, designing is not merely a form of decision making. So therefore, the statement that doesn't describe the design of the machine is choice D. This one is choice D is correct answer for this question. So the question. Let's move to the next question, question number four. Depending on the performance criteria, which machine element must meet a factor of safety will be applied to the design. Which one of the following points may not affect the decision of factor of safety? From this the listed one, which one may not affect the decision of factor of safety? A, the value of the maximum load and accuracy of calculations. B, the type of load on the machine element. C, the number of machine elements to be produced. D, error during manufacturing or construction. So let us explain this. So when we design, the decision on the factor of safety is primarily influenced by factors related to the performance and the reliability of the individual machine element, such as the maximum load, which is going to be carried, accuracy of the calculations, type of load and error during manufacture or the construction. And the number of machine elements to be produced is more related to manufacturing or production planning and may not directly impact 
the factor of safety for an individual element. So from the listed one or from the given choices, this choice C is correct answer. The number of machine elements to be produced doesn't affect the decision of factor of safety. Choice C is correct answer. Next question. If the ultimate tensile stress of a machine element is 750 newton per millimeter square, what load could safely be carried by the machine element of diameter 2.5 mm for a factor of safety of 5? A. 150 newton. B. 736.31 newton. C. 3682.5 newton. D. 2904.5.2 newton. So here, this is the it needs some calculation. So let's see the solution. So we have given that ultimate tensile stress, which is 750 newton per millimeter square, factor of 50, which is given as 5, the diameter, which is 2.5 millimeter, and we are asked to calculate the force or load. So to do so, we have to calculate first the area. So the area is calculated as pi times d square over 4, the area of the circle. We have given that diameter which is 2.5 millimeter. So pi times 2.5 millimeter square over 4, which is around 4.908 millimeter per millimeter square. And the actual stress, which is calculated as ultimate tensile stress over factor of safety. The ultimate tensile stress which is given and factor of safety also which is given. So which is 750 newton per millimeter square over 5. And when we solve this, the actual stress which is 150 newton per millimeter square. So simply we, now we can calculate the force or the, the load from this actual stress and the area, cross sectional area. So the, since the force or load is the product of area and the actual stress. The force that could safely be carried by the machine element is calculated as actual stress times the area. Actual stress which is calculated as 150 newton per millimeter square. And the area is calculated as 4.908 millimeter square. So when we multiply this, we get 736.2 Newton. So the load that could safely be carried by the machine element is approximately 736.2 Newton. Therefore, from the given alternative, this choice B, 736.31 Newton is correct answer. So the correct answer for this associated question is this one. So this is the correct answer. The sixth question. A property of a material which enables it to resist fracture due to high impact load is known as A. Strength B. Toughness C. Ductility D. Resilience so To select the best one, we have to know the definition of each one. What does strength mean? Toughness mean? Ductility and resilience mean? So, by defining this A, we can select the best answer for this question. So, when we say strength, it's a measure of material's ability to withstand applied force without breaking or deforming permanently. So, when we say this, when we say strength, the strength is the measure of material's ability to withstand and apply force without breaking or deforming permanently. When you say toughness, it's the property that relates a material's ability to absorb energy and form plastically before fracture. And when you say ductility, it's the measure of a material's ability to undergo significant plastic deformation before rupture or fracture. And when we say resilience, it is the ability of material to absorb energy and then release that energy upon unloading. And when we say this, 
It is the capacity of a material to absorb the formation and then return to its original shape. From the given alternative, the property of a material is that nevertheless, the material to resist fracture due to high impact load is known as toughness. This choice B is correct answer for this specific question. Toughness is the property of material which enables the material to resist fracture due to high impact load and this is the correct answer. Let's move to the next question. The bending moment M and the torque Q A is applied on a solid fracture. The bending moment M and the torque T is applied on a solid circular shaft. And if the maximum bending stress equal the maximum shear stress developed on that shaft, then the bending moment M is equal to A T B T over 2 C 40 D 2 T. So this is also the it needs some calculation or mathematical expression. So let us see this. Where the maximum bending stress developed due to bending moment on the solid shaft, solid cir circular shaft is given by this is the maximum bending stress which is equal to 32 times bending moment over pi d cube. This is the general formula. This is the general formula. So the maximum shear stress developed due to torque T on the solid circular shaft is given by tau which is 16 T over pi d cube. This is the formula to calculate maximum shear stress developed due to the torque on the solid circular shaft. So in the case here, the maximum bending stress which is equal with the maximum shear stress developed on the shaft. So when you say this, we have to equate these two equations. This one, this maximum bending stress, which is equal with maximum shear stress. Maximum shear stress. So 32m over pi d cube, 32m over pi d cube, which is equal with 60t over pi d cube. So here we have pi d cube, pi d cube. We have to cancel this. We can cancel this. And the remaining part is 32m which is equal to this, 60 t. So we, have, we, we are asked to calculate the maximum bending moment, the bending moment. So the bending moment, to, to calculate the bending moment, we have to divide the parties and the coefficient, 32, 32, and m is, m is equal to t over two. So the correct answer is b, the bending moment becomes half of the torque cube. So, B is correct answer. This B is correct answer for this question. When the bending moment M in the torque cube T is applied on solid shaft, and if the maximum bending stress equal to the maximum shear stress developed on the shaft, then the bending moment M is equal with half of the torque cube T. So this is the correct answer. Next question, which one of the following theories of failure is not applicable for ductile materials? A, gas theory of failure, B, maximum shear stress theory, C, maximum normal stress theory, D, dis distortion energy theory. So from this, which one is not applicable for ductile materials? So we have different theories when we perform the printout analysis on ductile materials so from that theories or from this listed one which one doesn't apply for that ductile materials from this the listed one the maximum shear stress theory and distortion energy theory are the uh, theories applicable for ductile materials usually this maximum shear stress theory this and the distortion theory are usually applicable for ductile materials and the maximum normal stress theory is generally applicable for brittle materials so this the maximum normal stress theory which is usually applicable for 
brittle materials. And as we know from this, this gas theory of Feiler, it is not well known theory of Feiler in the context of the material engineering and material engineering or in machine element part, this gas theory is not well known theory and automatically we rejected this uh, choice because it is not known. And here, when we say this, this the maximum normal stress theory is generally applicable for preterm materials. So from the given alternative, this choice C is correct answer. The maximum normal stress theory is not applicable for ductile materials. This, this theory is applicable for brittle materials. And for ductile materials, we apply maximum shear stress theory and distortion energy theory. These are applicable for ductile material. And the next one, the maximum normal stress theory, which is not applicable for ductile materials, rather, it is applicable for brittle materials. So choice C is correct answer. This maximum normal stress theory is not applicable for vector materials. This is applicable for brittle material. This, which one of the following theories of Feiler predicts that yielding occurs when the distortion strain energy per unit volume reaches or exceeds the distortion strain energy per unit volume for yield in simple tension or compression of the same material? A. Von Mises theory. B. Shear energy theory, C, octahedral shear stress theory, D, all of the above. So let us see the explanation. We have to know each theories to select the best one. So when is a von Mises theory? It is a theory that predicts yielding when the von Mises stress, that means the combination of normal and shear stress reaches a critical value. And it is this one Mrs. theory is usually applied or usually used for ductile materials. And in B, the shear energy theory, and this theory is based on the concept that yielding occurs when the accumulated shear strain energy in the material reaches a critical value. And when we go to the octahedral shear stress theory, this theory also suggests that yielding occurs when the octahedral shear stress reaches a critical value and it is commonly used for predicting yielding in materials under multi-axial stress state so each of these theories when we, we see this all of them or each of them has their own application and they are used under different circumstances depending on the nature of the stress depending on the nature of the stress state and the material behaviors therefore this choice D, all of the above is the correct answer. Therefore, this, each of these theories has its application and is used under different circumstances depending on the nature of the stress status and the materialist behavior. Therefore, D is the correct answer. The next question, Rankine's theory of failure is applicable for which, of, for which type of material? A, elastic materials. B. Ductile materials, C. Brittle materials, D. Plastic materials. So from this material, Rankine's theory of failure is applicable for which one? So when we say this, this the Rankine's theory is based on comparing the maximum normal stress to the material tensile or compression strength to determine whether failure will occur. So when we say this, it's, it doesn't account for the effect of shear stress and is considered less accurate for ductile materials where shear stress plays a significant role. So in this case, when we, we use this Rankine's theory, it doesn't consider the effect of shear stress and is considered less accurate for ductile materials because this shear stress is this shear stress plays a significant role in the failure of ductile materials. In that case, this ranking theory doesn't consider this shear stress. Due to that, it is not applicable for ductile materials. Therefore, this ranking theory is a criteria for predicting the failure of materials, and it is often used for applicable for brittle materials. So we apply this ranking theory for brittle materials. So the correct answer is choice C. So ranking theory is 
ranking story is applicable for written materials. Let's go to the next. The stress concentration factor is A, the ratio of the maximum stress to the working stress. B, the ratio of the maximum stress in a member, that means at the notch or a fillet, to the nominal stress at the same section based upon net area. C, the ratio of the maximum force to the working load. D, the ratio of maximum stress to the strain. So which one of these alternative expresses stress concentration factor? So to, to select the correct answer, we have to know what does mean stress concentration factor. So when we say stress concentration factor, it is a dimensionless factor that qualifies how much stress is increased at a point or future, such as a notch, hole, or fillet. When we compare this to the stress in our equivalent unnotched or unaltered sections. So this factor is important in assessing the impact of generic irregular impact of generic irregularities or stress risers such as notches or fillets. Therefore, from the given alternative, the one which rectally express stress concentration factor is choice B, the ratio of the maximum stress in a member at a notch or a fillet to the nominal stress at the same section based upon net area. So choice B is the correct answer. So this correctly defines the term stress concentration factor. The next, which one of the following fatigue failure criteria is the most conservative than others? A. Goodman criteria B. Gerber criteria C. Soderberg criteria D. Asme elliptic criteria But from this alternative, which one is the most conservative than the others? So let us do them one by one. What does Goodman criteria mean? What does Gerber criteria mean? What does Soderberg criteria mean? And what does Asme mean? Okay, when we say Goodman criteria, it's a linear relationship between alternating stress, both in nominal and shear, and mean stress. And it also involves dividing the alternative stress by a factor that is a function of the mean stress. And then this criteria accounts for the influence of the mean stress on the fatigue line. So this is our good, good man criteria. The next one is Gerber criteria. What does Gerber criteria mean? When we say Gerber criteria, this is a modification of the Goodman criteria and is used to account for the influence of mean stress on the fatigue life. And it involves also similarly dividing the alternative stress by a factor that is a function of the mean stress. And this is also often used in case where the mean stress is compressive. So when the mean stress is compressive, we use this Gerber criteria. And when we go to the asthma elliptic criteria, this is another approach for the fatigue analysis and it is based on the ellipse fitted to the stress cycle on a stress amplitude diagram. So this uh, ellipse is derived from a linear combination of a normal and a shear stress and the criteria involves checking whether the point representing the stress cycle falls within the ellipse to determine fatigue failure. So when we come to the Soderberg criteria. This Soderberg criteria is a linear combination of normal and shear stress and set the unlevel stress below the material's endurance limit. And from this, the fatigue failure criteria that is generally considered the most conservative among the options provided is Soderberg criteria under choice C. So uh, the other criteria is mentioned, Goodman criteria, the Gerber criteria, and as make a elliptic criteria are also commonly used in fatigue analysis which was their own assumption and consideration however this Sutterberg is often considered more conservative than the others in practice so the correct answer is choice c the next question stress concentration is not caused due to 
A. Variation in properties of material from point to point in a number. B. Abrupt change of section. C. Pitting at points or areas at which loads on a member is applied or member are applied. D. Gradual transitions in the design. So from this characteristics, which one doesn't cause stress concentration? So to, to select the perfect answer, we have to know also, we have to discuss each point. The stress concentration is typically caused by abrupt change in the geometrical configuration of a structural member, such as notches, holes, fillets, or abrupt change in the section. So this gradual transition in the design helps to reduce stress concentration and distribute stress more uniformly, contributing to better structural performance. Stress concentrations are more likely to occur when there are abrupt changes in geometry, variation in material properties, and localized damage or heating. So this gradual transition is designed which help to mitigate the stress concentration by promoting smaller stress distribution within the structural member. Therefore, from this the given alternative, the stress concentration which is not caused due to gradual transition in the design. This doesn't cause stress concentration, rather it helps to mitigate stress concentration by promoting a smoother stress distribution within the structural members. So the correct answer is choice D, this choice D, gradual transmissions, gradual transition in the design doesn't cause stress concentration. Next question. Endurance limit or fatigue limit is the maximum stress that a member can withstand for an infinite number of load application without failure when subjected to cyclic or completely reversible load. Which one of this which one of the following factors can affect endurance limit? A surface condition, B size and shape of the membrane, C material type and composition, D load and loading conditions, E all of the above. From this which one can affect endurance limit of the so Select the correct answer. Also, we have to discuss each and every point. Each and every point. So what does surface condition mean? What does surface condition mean? When is a surface condition? This is a material condition, including the presence of surface imperfections, scratches, or corrosions, which can influence the initiation and propagation of fatigue crack. So this is the surface condition and a smoother surface generally contributes to higher endurance limit. When the surface is smooth, there is high endurance limit. So that means the surface condition can affect the endurance limit. The next one is size and shape of the membrane. When you say this, the size the size and geometry of structural membrane can affect stress concentration and the distribution of stresses influencing the fatigue performance. So large and more complex, as we know, large and more complex components may express different stresses state and consequently different endurance limits. So this the size and the shape of the membrane can affect also the endurance limit. And when we come to the material type and composition, different material activities different fatigue behavior and factors such as material type, composition, heat treatment, and microstructure play a crucial role in determining the fatigue strengths and some materials have high endurance limit than the others. So this is the material type and the composition also can affect the endurance limit. And when we come to the load and loading conditions, the magnitude, the frequency as well as the type of loading conditions that, that may be cyclic loading, or random loading, which can significantly impact the fatigue life of a material. And the endurance limit is, the endurance limit can vary under different loading conditions. So when there is different loading condition, the endurance limit also varies. That means this loading condition can directly affect the endurance limit. This the endurance limit is influenced by the combination of factors including surface condition, size, and shape of member material type and composition and load and load and loading conditions and from the given alternative e 
choice A, all are, or all of the mentioned can influence the endurance limit of the material. The next question, form of stress that occur in welded component without externally applied load is A, fatigue stress, B, residual stress, C, yield stress, D, tensile stress, E, all of the above. Okay, so to select the correct answer, we have to know this, what does fatigue stress mean, residual stress, yield stress, tensile stress, so we have to define this power. This power choices must have, must have to be defined. So when you say this fatigue stress, it is a type of uh, cyclic loading stress that occurs when the material is subjected to repeated loading and unloading. And the contact of a uh, weld component, fatigue stress might occur due to cyclic loading during the component, the component service life. So if there is cyclic loading, there may be fatigue stress. And the other, when you come to the yield stress, it is the stress at which the material undergoes plastic deformation and it occurs when the applied stress exceeds the material yield stress or yield strength. And in this, in the context of a welded component, this yield stress can occur when the applied load reach or exceeds the yield strength of the material. And, and when we can do the tensile stress, this stress is a type of axial stress that tends to stretch or elongate a material and it can occur when the material is subjected to force trying to pull it apart and in the context of this uh, welded component this tensile stress may be present depending on the nature of the applied loads therefore the form of stress that can occur in welded component without externally applied load is the residual stress this residual stress can occur without any external load. Therefore, this choice B, this is the correct answer. Therefore, this residual stress can occur without applying external load on the welded component. So this is the correct answer. Okay, so this is the questions and the video that is regarding this machine element model exit exam questions and you have to share this video for the others and if you are new for this channel you have to subscribe this youtube channel and i will upload different videos on different courses so if you have you are new for this channel you have to subscribe you have to share the video for the others you have to like the video also and you have to encourage me by commenting different or by giving different comments Thank you for watching this video until the end and thank you. I will come the next part. I will come with the part two of this machine element on the next videos.